Welcome to Crucial Conversations, a series of conversations with various guests to engage on important subjects. This series is coming to you from Central Christian Church in downtown Indianapolis. This month's series is called Standing in the Need of Prayer, in which we'll explore this very basic practice of our faith, namely prayer, from a variety of perspectives. Please join us each week on Thursdays as we release a new episode. Welcome to Crucial Conversations, coming to you from Central Christian Church in Indianapolis, where this month we are talking about prayer. Uh, we are standing in the need of prayer and we are sharing experiences and um, knowledge about prayer, hoping to learn something um, about our own prayer life and share that with others. And I'm very excited today to have Dr. Wilma Bailey with us. Um, Dr. Bailey is a professor emerita of Hebrew, script, Hebrew Bible and Aramaic Scripture from Christian Theological Seminary here in Indianapolis. Um, Dr. Bailey uh, came to CTS uh, in the year 2000 after doing a lot of other things, um, she has uh, academic degrees from Vanderbilt University, as well as um, Goshen Biblical Seminary or the Associated Mennonite Biblical Seminaries, as well as Hunter Lehman College. And prior to uh, coming to CTS, she served on the faculty of Messiah College and of Goshen College. She is uh, the author of books and articles and Bible study guides um, and is active um, as well in the Mennonite church, serving on, ha having served on, possibly serving now, on um, various boards of that church. So Dr. Bailey, welcome. Thank you for being with us. It is a pleasure to see you and to have this conversation with you. You're welcome. It's good to be here. So I thought maybe uh, we could start by asking you in your own life, uh, before you started studying uh, the Hebrew well, Bible, uh, but as you were growing up, how did you learn about prayer and what do you think you learned about prayer as you were growing up? Well, um, as I was growing up, um, we went to Sunday school every single Sunday, but we did not always stay to worship service until I was about 12. Then we started staying to the worship service also every Sunday. We prayed in church and we did not pray as a family at home except for saying grace when we were all gathered around the, the table for, uh, for, for dinner. Um, so saying grace was our, my primary experience in prayer at home growing up until probably I got into my teenage years. And then uh, through some influence from a camp that I went to, uh, I myself started to pray more at home, just alone. Um, so that was my growing up experience with prayer. Okay, thank you. Uh, and then I know uh, you have spent a lot of your life um, studying and teaching about the Bible. And so I wonder if you could share with us what your study, I know this is a very big question, uh, but what your study has uh, taught you or helped you learn about prayer. Well, um, I became very interested in, although this is the uh, other uh, testament, but in uh, the Jesus prayer in the Gospels, because um, uh, Jesus was clearly in the Gospel of Matthew reacting to the way people were praying. And he began in the Gospel of Matthew by telling the disciples how not to pray. And, you know, don't pray like the hypocrites do. And so 
that took me then to the, the Hebrew scriptures that uh, I work in to see how people were praying up until the time of Jesus, that Jesus had this very strong reaction to the way pre people were praying uh, at that time. And in the Gospel of Luke, uh, there's a different context where the disciples come to Jesus and say, uh, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples to pray. And I wondered why they asked that, because the disciples were all Jews. They must have known how to pray. I mean, they were familiar with the synagogue. They went to synagogue. And so they knew how to pray. So what were they asking Jesus uh, beyond that? And so that got me into looking at how prayer appears in the, in the Hebrew Bible. And, um, and of course, usually scholars will begin with a definition of what they are going to be studying and uh, often definitions, when you get down to it, are not so easy. <laughs> uh, I remember at some point back uh, in New York when I was um, uh, a bit older, people describing prayer as conversation with God. And the interesting thing is that's not how scholars uh, describe prayer. Because in the Bible, you have these stories like with Abraham and uh, Moses where they're chatting with God and God is responding with words. And uh, so usually a distinction is made between those conversations with God and what we call prayer where a person addresses God and you do not usually get an, an audible response. And so uh, looking at that, and then I, I wanted to follow what happened to prayer over all those generations. So looking at some of the early literature versus some of the, the later literature, uh, prayer changed actually significantly. Uh, and uh, in the beginning, uh, you have these very short petitions and I thought discovering that was interesting because some people think um, you, shouldn't be, you shouldn't be greedy when you're praying. You shouldn't be asking all the time for things. And yet the earliest prayers uh, that we have recorded in the Bible are short petitions, such as when uh, Miriam develops this skin condition and her brother prays, Lord, heal her. That's the entire prayer. It's an address to God with a petition. And most of the early prayers are these short petitions. They're just straightforward petitions. And then they get longer and longer and longer as you go through the Hebrew scriptures based upon what we know about what came earlier and what came, came later. Uh, and as I look at the uh, book of Judges, where we have this pattern where the Israelites or various tribes of the Israelites get into trouble because of something that they have done. And then it says, well, they cried out to the Lord and God responds. And there is no petition, there's no um, confession. There's no repentance. They just get into trouble. They ask God to, to get them out of trouble and God responds, gets them out of trouble. And so, you know, when I was taught about prayer, I was thought, you know, you've got to confess first. You've got to repent first. And then God may respond to you. But that's not the pattern that you see in Judges and in some other books also of the, the Hebrew Bible. And I found it interesting too that, um, People in praying in the Hebrew Bible and the stories that we have from the Hebrew Bible, that they don't often pray what you think they ought to pray given the situation that they're in. 
I mean, we have this, um, we have this story, for example, about Jonah, of course, who's in the belly of the fish. And Jonah prays in the belly of the fish. Well, you know, he never asks to be released from the belly of the fish. You would think that's what he'd be praying about. <laughs> but he's not praying about that. But rather, he is, um, uh, he is recalling his close relationship to God in the past and how he wants that back again. He imagines himself worshiping in the temple. And you see the same kind of thing in some of the Daniel prayers, which are again late, where he doesn't pray exactly for the situation at hand, but rather he's praying in a different kind of way. And so, uh, so I think about prayer as being not so much a conversation with God, as a communion, an experience of communion with God. And so it's where you realize that you're in the presence of God um, and that you don't really have to ask because God already knows what you need. But I think that prayer, I see prayer as an important uh, piece of spiritual growth and growing closer to God. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously petition in prayer is fine because Jesus taught his disciples to pray. And that prayer that Jesus taught is mostly petition. We have an opening recognition of God's holiness and then we have a series of petitions. Lead us not into temptation. Give us our daily bread. Um, forgive us our sin. Uh, so petition is okay. Uh, and, uh, and expected part of prayer, even though God already knows what you need. Uh, but in the Jesus prayer, Jesus and teaching his disciples, according to the Gospel of Matthew, uh, it's not necessary to go on and on and on. But you read some of the, the prayers in the latter part of the Hebrew Bible, and the prayers go on and on and on. They get longer and longer. And a lot of those prayers are reciting the history of Israel. And all of that is in it. And it seems to be the prayer, the function of the prayer is to uh, remember how God has walked with Israel through many generations and through many times of trial and struggle and that God is still with them. Now, when uh, those longer prayers that are recitations of God's mighty acts, are, are those primarily the Psalms in the Psalms? Are there other places those are found? Oh, there are other places that they're found, yes. Like in, um, in, in the book of Daniel, in, in uh, Nehemiah, uh, in the Psalms, the Psalms are prayers. Uh, and uh, I remember my professor, Walter Harrelson at Vanderbilt used to say, these are prayers that people prayed. They're not necessarily prayers that they ought to have prayed. That's what he would say. Okay. And what he meant by that is that you have in the Psalms uh, prayers calling for vengeance upon you know, those who have mistreated the, the prayer in the, in the Psalm. Uh, and I think this is, this is also a point um, in terms of, of God responding to prayer or answering prayer. Um, these calls for vengeance in the prayers, I think, are serving as a substitute for actually taking vengeance because they don't actually take the vengeance, but they're calling on God because they're expressing how they feel, the anguish that they feel, and really a desire for justice. 
uh, but it's all left in the hands of God. And, um, uh, and uh, you know, we don't have God's response to that. I mean, that's, that's another thing that's different as we move through time with the prayers in the Bible, because early on with that short petition, like with um, Miriam, the prayer for healing, and she is healed. Um, and you have that response in the, in the uh, narrative, in the story forms. But when you get to the Psalms, of course, you don't know what happened because you're not given that in the Psalm um, or in the Book of Lamentations, the same thing. You're not, get, you're not given whether there is a particular response to the prayers uh, that are prayed. Well, and uh, in some of the other kinds of prayer you were mentioning, like Jonah, for example, there, there is a petition or there is, in a sense, there could be an answer, but it's not necessarily the answer uh, that, that the person wants. Or I'm thinking of, you know, his prayer to God or his request to God to, to wipe out the Ninevites, right? Um, so that, as you said about him, that was not necessarily the prayer he should have prayed in the belly of the beast or um, n not necessarily in close communion with God, but there was some sort of response from God that was not of what he exactly asked for. <laughs> yes, uh, and, and that particular example is interesting because what he actually prayed in he the Hebrew word is to overturn. Mm. And uh, what happens is that Nineveh does get overturned, but not in the way that Jonah wanted. Okay. Right. Jonah wanted to see them all wiped out, but rather they all repent, which is okay. another way of overturning things, okay. uh, which is another, uh, uh, another way, you know, when we pray that God responds, but in a way that we don't mm -hmm. expect. Oh, you know. I'm, I'm curious about um, the, your mention of Abraham and Moses sort of chatting with God, just having yeah. sort of this kind of a natural conversation. So it, as the Hebrew scriptures are written, is, is that kind of an early form of communication with God? Do you, or, or do you see that later in um, the history or in the writings? I think that's earlier. Uh, we see that earlier, later on. Um, yeah, we have, we have less of that. I'm trying to think whether in some of those late books like Chronicles, I'm thinking in Chronicles, God can respond through a prophet. Mm. You know, the prophets come in later. And I think that, you know, the prophet will bring the word as to how God has responded as opposed to a direct response. And is the assumption there that the, the, the prophet has had a previous conversation with God? Yes. Okay. Yes. So I'm, I'm wondering how uh, your study um, of prayer over a number of years or of, and of the Bible has influenced or impacted your own practice of prayer? One way, I think that um, uh, I used to pray more at particular times, mm -hmm. but um, now I think I pray more spontaneously and as the prayer is needed. Um, when I tell someone I'm going to pray for you, I pray right then and there. <laughs> I don't say I'm putting this on my prayer list so when I pray later on, I'll pray about it. Although I do if I tell them I'm continuing to pray. But um, I think that has been the major change that uh, I pray uh, whenever uh, I feel a need for myself or other people 
I just do it right then and there. Um, in the Bible, are, I mean, you, you talked about sort of this progression or evolution from chatting to more of a sense of being in union or communion with God. But in the Bible, does prayer always involve words? Are, are words in, necessary for prayer in the Bible? I think not. I think, um, uh, you know, very often in the Bible it says so-and-so prayed and we don't know the words that they prayed or if they use words in prayer. I think that not all prayer consisted of words. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's another thing about using that conversation with God a definition because that assumes words. Mm -hmm. But I think that People prayed in different ways, sometimes through body movements, through um, uh, dance, um, through the use of music, um, through silence. You know, we have Jesus um, withdrawing to the wilderness, and Moses does that as well. And, um, uh, and you don't get the sense that they're talking all the time with God but rather they are in the presence of God uh, and trying to discern what God is calling them to do, to do next. I just think that in, in, in my life also that, you know, it's not the words that, that are most important, but it is sort of the connection to God, which I think can take place in different, in different ways. One of the questions that has been running through these conversations that we're having in prayer, um, I put it as like, what happens? What happens in prayer? What, or what is happening uh, when people pray? And so um, I just pose that question to you, either you know, from the varieties of prayer that are in the scriptures or for your own life, what do you think is happening um, when you are praying or when people in the Bible are praying? Yeah, that's a, that's a good, good question. Um, I think that uh, prayer makes us more aware of uh, our own limitations mm -hmm. and, um, and that God is unlimited. Now, we don't always get an answer to prayer that can be discerned if we're asking not all prayer is petition um but um and so i think it draws us closer to god to the spiritual world uh and i think it helps us to get more insight into other people uh as well i think it makes us more humble and uh, just to follow up a little bit, when, when you tell someone you are praying for them, you know, so often that's called intercessory prayer, yes. what, uh, what, what is happening in that kind of prayer for you? Let's see, that's a good question. <laughs> I, have to, I have to think about that a minute. What is happening in that that prayer. I mean, I am asking, you know, usually in an intercessory prayer, it's because um, a person uh, feels a need for help beyond what they can get. Maybe they want healing or, or something like that. And so I'll say, I'll pray for you. And um, and I leave it to, to God as to what, what actually happens. Um, because what I may want to happen may not be the best thing to happen, uh, in that case. But I'm, I, I think it's a hard, I can only use human language, you know, I can't, but I think it's sort of that, um, I don't think I need to call God's attention to this particular need. 
and yet it's saying, I care too about this person who is making a request, asking me to pray for this person. And so I do think that something happens. I'm not sure I can say exactly what. Yeah, that's fair enough. I, I think if, if, if we knew the answer to that question, we probably wouldn't need to be having all these conversations. Right. Yeah, I do think it's one of the things that is um, so perplexing about prayer um, for many, many people, you know, why sometimes you pray for healing for a friend and the person does get healing and other times, obviously many times, the outcome that we're praying for uh, doesn't happen. Right. So it keep that question, I think, just stays alive just from our life experience. Right, exactly, you know. But I keep praying, even though I, you know, even though it's true, you know, sometimes it, it seems like God is not responding, but I just keep praying. Mm -hmm. uh, right, and that speaks to the mystery um, right. about God, uh, everything God related. Uh, there's a great amount of mystery. Are there other or any particular questions that, that stay alive for you related to prayer? I think, uh, well, I've been thinking a, a bit about um, how um, in the Bible, people who are not sharing the faith, you know, we have a very good example with Abraham and uh, Abraham sends the servant to find a wife for Isaac, his son, and that servant who does not share the religious faith of Abraham, prays to Abraham's God to give him wisdom as to which woman he should choose. And God responds. So God responds even to the prayer of this person who does not share the same notions of, of who God is. Uh, and um, so, I think about that in terms of today, in terms of people praying all over the world with different understandings of faith, different religions. But I believe that everybody who prays to God, that God is hearing that prayer. And, um, and in whatever way God chooses is responding. Uh, and so uh, I, um, want to learn, I think we can learn more about prayer, even in um, uh, learning more about other religions and how they, they think about prayer uh, and uh, what's happening and how they do it. Um, and we see in other religions, think about Islam, the physical part of prayer, you know, the bowing all the way to the ground and the moving the head from side to side you know, this bodily um, response, uh, you know, maybe we can learn something from that and we can learn more from how other people pray. Yes, it, it does seem to me that uh, some of our, some of the other uh, great world religions, I don't, I, I don't mean this in any kind of pejorative way, pejorative way toward Christianity, but have perhaps a more robust um, structure or practice of prayer. There's, there's a little bit more structure than in a lot of um, the church settings that, that I've been a part of. Yeah. And the other thing that makes me think about is um, sort of the, the opportunity, as you're saying, front to, to learn from others in prayer and along with that goes kind of a challenge in learning to pray together. Um, so a couple of interfaith um, or multi-faith uh, groups that, that I'm a part of, you know, I see that, um, that we all, you know, we just all have something to learn in uh, praying in ways that are open and inclusive and, and help everyone feel connected in that prayer. Yes. Yeah. 
So praying in the name of Jesus in a multi-faith group may not be one of the best ways. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, I really thank you uh, for the time that you have spent with us today. I don't know if you have any kind of final word that you want to share uh, with our listeners today. Well, my final word would be be encouraged and keep praying and, um, uh, and experience the spiritual growth that I think God um, wants for every, everyone. Mm, great. Thank you so much. And thank you to all of you who have been watching and listening this episode. Stay tuned for future episodes.